I would like to offer some uh, tentative suggestions or which can be used or abused or questioned um, uh, about the, uh, the geopolitical vocation of the South Caucasus because uh, obviously it's, it's nobody's business to uh, advise other countries, independent countries, sovereign countries, including the countries of, of this region, uh, what the type of uh, geopolitical uh, position or orientation to seek or to which values they have to uphold unless they choose it out of their free will. So, um, so I would like to speak. I would like to offer some uh, suggestions or some my, my ideas, and some of which I borrowed from the authors, which are not uh, commonly uh, uh, commonly basically referred to. Uh, firstly, I would like to speak about that so the, 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 the concept or the regional uh, identity of South Caucasus actually has been questioned, and it's very. Uh, uh, tempting to, to, to look into this, you know, they may be familiar with this, uh, but I would like to point to those two authors, Eldar Ismail, uh, Ismailov and Vladimir Papava. They actually questioned the, the whole notion of the South Caucasus, which is the, the basically the primary uh, regional uh, focus of this conference, and they, they speak, they question uh, this uh, notion as a result of the uh, historical conjuncture, because as we know that in general, uh, the uh, it's commonly accepted that the South Caucasus is, like, is located between the Black, Caspian, and Azov Seas, and this definition suffers from the Russocentric bias in the conception of the region. Uh, Russians obviously coined uh, these terms as a Transcaucasus or Transcaucasia, and during the col colonial period, uh, between 1801, I'm talking about the, the uh, integration of, of Georgia into the Russian Empire, in 1991, the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union, the Russian terms enter, entered the international practice and Transcaucasus and Transcaucasia become kind of very common uh, re reference points to, the, to this region. Um, but more so, the, the, during the, the, this period, the southern limits of the Caucasus in the last two centuries were identical actually with the Russian Empire's southern border in the Caucasus. It's a very important historical point. The border change in the 19th century, in the end of 19th century in the case of the Kars province is a case in the point because when, uh, when Russia acquired Kars from the Ottoman Empire, Kars became to be known as a part of the Caucasus. And when Russia lost territories of the Kars, Ardahan and Bayezid, the Russian political and historical documents stopped referring to them as parts of the Caucasus. And when in November 1918, these regions proclaimed their independence and formed the Southwestern Caucasian uh, Democratic Republic or Kars Republic. The name clearly indicates that uh, that the Republic identified as a, its a Caucasian affiliation. Uh, uh, so Eldar Ismailov, as I mentioned, Vladimir Papova introduced a new geographic classification for Caucasus in their work titled Rethinking the Central Eurasia, published by the Central Asia Caucasus Institute and uh, Silk Road Studies Program. They suggested that Caucasus as a geographic region includes not only the Russian Federation, the North Caucasus, the three new states, which will be the, the, no, the focus of the paper, but also the territories of Turkish pro provinces of Ahri, Ardahan, Ardvin, Van, Ihdir, and Kars, and also in, uh, Hamad, uh, in the Iranian north northwestern parts of Iran, Astana, Eastern Azerbaijan, Ardabil, Gilan, Zinjan, Kazvin, Hamadan, Western Azerbaijan. Speci I mean, it's not a political, God forbid, uh, I'm talking about purely geographic uh, division. This division is based not only on the fact that the Turkish and Iranian regions have been populated by the Caucasian people since the time immemorial, but, uh, but it's very, what's also important in geographic terms that the, those regions are equidistant from the main Cauc Caucasian uh, range. If, if we're talking the northern part, being northern, it's the North Caucasus and Southern Caucasus. So the, the, what they conceptualized that the, this, the, those three countries, Armenia, Azerbaijan, really uh, belong to the central Caucasus because they really like co co coincide with the direction of the main, the Caucasian range. And, but obviously, uh, one of the, w why this whole issue is raised because those authors think that because of the, the Soviet Union uh, and its, in its legacy, it, it's past and the, the countries need to find central, so-called so -called centrality becomes the, the referring term here, the re recurring, recurring term that they're central in the, in the Caucasus. They're not, no, no, they're not South Caucasus because there are some regions historically been known as South Caucasus. Another 
I would like to uh, refer you to that. Um, uh, obviously, the Caucasus in in the history of this region, which we know, uh, such uh, it was always in the interest of the gra the great imp uh, powers of every uh, period in human civilization were very attracted to this to this region. I'm talking about the Greece. Persia, the Roman Empire, the Arab Caliphate, the Mongol Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and others. So there is a common theme that the great powers, for one reason, for mostly for political or geopolitical reasons, are always attracted to find a foothold or sphere of influence in this region. So there is like no kind of such a novelty as the the previous uh, com yesterday's conference was looking at the geopolitical uh, implications of the great power sort of competition in the region. Uh, what another interesting feature that despite the, those being in the kind of in the push and pull of those great powers influences, the three nations which existed in this, in these lands had always to find their own national interest and defined it through their prism, not through the prism of the interested parties or third or third parties in this in this case great powers. It's also common kind of historical recurring theme, and it's very important to understand that that's really the. The, the key, uh, not to, to kind of to appease such and such power, or appease such and such geopolitical construction, but to find its own sort of identity, which is naturally naturally flows from the local thinking, from the local perspective, from the local interests, not through the kind of geopolitical construction of, of the third party. It's very it's very obviously important uh, aspect of the of the transition from being. Dependent, half dependent, but completely the independent uh, sovereign state, like uh, Turkey. We know it was also at the, at the mercy of the powers after, after the end of the First World War, and the, uh, Atatürk was able to find its own genuine Turkish kind of Turkish agenda. So these countries also need to find their own native agendas instead of kind of following some prescriptions from either party. Uh, that's also a very interesting uh, 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 idea, uh, which, which is very important for the uh, finding of geopolitical vacation. Uh, another important thing is that, that it's obviously oil, which in the, in the modern era brought the attention of the Western powers of Western businesses to this region, to, despite the maybe cultural richness and cultural uh, in, uh, in integrity of this region, obviously it was oil which was found on um, in in, uh, 1890, in in 1860s uh, in in Baku out uh, in 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 the shelf of uh, in, Baku, in the Caspian Shelf, and it brought such you know powerhouses of the 19th century as the Rothschilds and uh, and, uh, and, Nor and and Noble Brothers, which really attracted uh, the Western interest uh, to this region to begin with, and this. And another important geopolitical sort of uh, uh, precursor of the ba Baku Jihan, it's, it's maybe this uh, famous uh, the railroad which was built by the Rothschild brothers in, uh, and was completed in, in 1890, which was bringing oil from Baku to Batumi. It was the first kind of uh, east-west in modern times, I'm talking about, not Silk Road of the 11th century. It's the first modern um, uh, means through, through which this region was integrated into the so-called global markets or the global uh, uh, um, uh, kind of global means of exchange. So it's, it's also very interesting. Uh, uh, but but not less interesting, going back uh, to, to our historical kind of records, I, you may be familiar with this author, but it was a Georgian uh, diplomat and uh, uh, political think thinker whose name is Zurab Avalov, if you're familiar with his name, who served as a deputy foreign minister of a short-lived uh, democratic uh, Georgia between 18, 1918 and 1920. And he addressed a lot of ideas which are uh, highly popularized by people like Brzezinski and, and many others. Actually, I, I found uh, the, the qu quotations by quotations, like the similar, similar ideas and similar uh, purely um, prescriptions for how to construct a new identity for the for this region and uh, he wrote back in this book uh, in which was published in 1924 in in, in france uh, avalov adv advanced um, the main idea he said which he expressed in 1918 to implement the brest litovsk system in the region 
Avalov originated this idea that called for creation of the three independent states of the Caucasus to serve as a buffer zone. Uh, the system was conditioned on the recognition of the brest of Treaty and the German control of, of, over Georgia. The Georgian government saw that the benefits of the Georgian, uh, Ger German alliance, and this is a quote, the Caucasus Isthmus could be transformed in, into a new state entities, borderings or bordering on a new Russian border, which accounted for, for as far as I know, for the brest Treaty. A buffer state in the Caucasus would have solved the problem of the German influence in Anatolia and provide stability for the brest system, as he called it, with reference to the approaches to India and cairo calcutta axis. The idea of the buffer state in the Caucasus, cherished by the government of Georgia, Noe Jordania, called for the ouster of Russia from the Caucasus Isthmus. You have two minutes. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, another uh, idea which is, I think is relevant is the idea of, of so-called westernistic identity, uh, which calls not for, for the countries which have separate uh, historical trajectory, uh, but who are really following the Western uh, sort of uh, civilizational uh, vocation, but they're, they're not really purely Western by some, by some standards. And uh, talking about this, obviously, the three countries here, uh, even though they're obviously following Euro-Atlantic uh, orientation, the question becomes, it's a timing and a pace of integration. And in this case, uh, as our previous speakers very abundantly uh, uh, brought evidence to, to, the, to, the, to the floor, uh, essentially, it seems that uh, Azerbaijan uh, chose uh, a, a pace and a particular path to the pursuing the Euro-Atlantic Euro standards, the Euro-Atlantic integration, which at, at this point in time seems to be successful. Uh, despite that the Georgia was on the forefront and for, and uh, under Saakashvili they followed so-called crash course of westernization, uh, it uh, created a, a, a serious, a very dramatic response from Russia which we all aware of. And uh, in another aspect of this, that in, in, on the social and domestic level, in the, in, there are a lot of uh, layers of population in Georgia which also were not very happy with, the, with this very drastic uh, follow, follow, following the Western prescriptions and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that cause that brought about Ivanishvili, who is very, uh, in, in some sense, untested figure because there were a lot of rumors about his uh, sort of origins of his wealth and his background in Russia. But even though he definitely the, Western, the drive to westernization in Georgia was slowed down, drastically slowed down over the last few years, uh, since no, like actually two years since Ivanishvili came to power. But Ivanishvili also is, is, has limitations to how far he can diverge from this, from this course, because obviously the situation, the recognition of the Abkhazia and the Ossetia, which is by, considered by, by Georgia as an integral part of its, uh, of its territory, it, it constrains the further re reapprochement with Russia. Uh, talking about Armenia, Armenia uh, also made a very strange U-turn very recently and uh, when the uh, Rus Russian government tried to push them to uh, sign on on the customs union, on pursuing customs union with, with the Russian Federation, on looking forward as the next uh, horizon as the Eurasian Union, uh, only so suddenly uh, Ar Armenia becomes kind of a spoiled child and basically uh, speed, speeds up its uh, uh, application for the, um, uh, the some form of integration with the European Union. Which obviously, yeah, yeah, and uh, basically to, uh, to to sum up, it seems uh, so far, on on as evidence was, has shown, that Azerbaijan showed maybe a slow, very sl kind of slower pace of integration, and it's chosen to be non-aligned state, which is very important uh, part of its uh, ge geopolitical vocation, and whereas to other countries uh, seem to be one was pursuing westernization too fast, and one obviously is uh, too slow. 